Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet. Risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind partners. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp for you.com mtp for you.com to start your 30 day free trial. Very excited today to be here with Bill Reichert. Um, Bill uh, can easily be described as the Oracle of Palo Alto. And uh, after grinding his teeth in e learning software back in the 80s and 90s, Bill <laughs> is uh, probably one of the most busy angel investors I know. Uh, he's been doing this since 1998. Um, and has first been working with a company called Garage Technology Ventures with Guy Kawasaki and is now um, under the roof of Pegasus Tech Ventures. Bill, thanks for coming and welcome to the Judgment Call podcast. My pleasure. Thank you, Torsten, for inviting me. I am delighted and honored to be part of this. Thank you very much. We're really happy to have you here. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was saying there's a little bit in jest um, that you're the Oracle of Palo Alto, but here's, here's what I found. So um, I looked up a statement that is attributed to you. I'm not sure it's actually something you said on the panel discussion. <laughs> you, you said, and okay. you know, I'm, I'm quoting you supposedly, that's from an article, so I haven't, uh, I don't have the, the, the first-hand um, source. It says, I only invest in companies that even a complete idiot can run. Oh. <laughs> and yes, um, that is something so. that is, you know, also attributed to Warren Buffett. He said something very similar. And well, obviously I was uh, like, hmm, every other VC I talked to says, you know, I really want to invest in talent. I don't actually care about the company. The company is useless and it will change in two years again. So yeah. what, do you, what do you think about that? So, so yes, I, I said that somewhat tongue in cheek. I actually heard that first um, from a guy named Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch was a mutual mm -hmm. fund. Peter Lynch invented a fund called the Magellan Fund, which was a top performing um, mm -hmm. fund yeah. uh, in the late 20th century. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, and his, his point, which resonated with, with me, which is why I, re I repeated his point, um, is that all too often entrepreneurs get too wrapped up in trying to be more clever than the next guy and trying to invent something new or different um, just to be new and different when in many cases sort of standard approaches blocking and tackling is perfectly good. And so I, 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 I stay away from entrepreneurs who try to be sort of, as we say, too clever by half, who okay. over over engineer business models, over-engineer products, over-engineer their business when they don't have to because they believe somehow being smarter than everybody else, they can do something more clever than everyone else. So my point is that obviously simplicity is a way to scale a company 
faster than complexity. And, sure. and yeah. so it's not, it's, it's not that I really want my entrepreneurs to be complete idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope, I, hope, I was like, Matt, if you pull this off with complete idiots, <laughs> you're a genius, right? I mean, yeah, you, the, people should just give up. You're, you're the, you're the you know, you know. Unfortunately, I have run across those entrepreneurs, but no. I mean, the the point is, there's yep. enough difficulty. There's enough difficulty in building a team and scaling a company that adding complexity to your underlying business and business model, you know, doesn't serve you well. So simplicity yeah. in your business, business model and conception is a virtue so that you as an entrepreneur can focus your attention on, you know, the particular challenges that inevitably you're going to have. Sure. So yeah. that was yeah. the, that was the big idea. Not that I'm looking for, not that I'm looking for idiots, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I could gather this, but you know, that was the headline. I think the article was a couple of pages and that was the headline everyone focused on. You know? And that was 15 years ago or 10 years ago. So it's yeah, not just it was a while of, ago. You know, this, this has been around for, for quite some time. Yeah. Um, but, and, and, you know, and I don't think the world, in spite of the fact that that was a long time ago, I don't think the world, um, you know, I don't think the world's any different in that regard. So I think yeah. the underlying point still, you know, is, is still true. Try to design your company to be as simple as possible so that you can focus your intention on the hard things. Yeah. Um, tell me, tell the audience a little more how you got into angel investing and what, 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 what helped you there for, for a very long time. A lot of people do this um, kind of as a hobby. They do it for a while and then they give up. But you, you, you've You've seen it all. You've seen the the, the mm -hmm. 90s. Um, how did you get into angel investing? The first place, yeah. what did you do before? And then uh, how do you feel about the industry? Yeah. So so to be clear in our terminology here, um, I am technically, I am a venture capitalist, not an angel investor. So okay. I am, I, you know, when I crossed over into venture capital, we set up a venture capital firm that did seed stage investing. And so our big idea was to create a venture capital firm that would bridge between angels and the larger institutional venture capital firms. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so this was this gap in the middle between angels and institutional venture capital firms at, that at the time we referred to it as seed stage investing, which right. yeah. for us, Seed stage investing meant sort of two guys in a garage or two gals in a garage or a guy and a gal and a dog, whatever it took. But it was the very earliest form of, of venture capital investing. Angel investing is investing by individuals out of their own pockets. And yeah. while I have done some of that, Garage Technology Ventures and Pegasus Tech Ventures, they are both venture capital firms. Mm -hmm. And I'm a partner in those venture capital firms doing venture capital investing primarily with other people's money. And so yeah. that's the difference between angel and venture. Venture is generally using other people's money, some of, some of our own, but mainly other people's money. So that's, that's just to be clear, you know, sort yeah. of on, on my history and background. But in terms of how I got to venture capital, um, so I actually started out here in Silicon Valley a long, long time ago. <laughs> um, okay. I, when I was, I came to Stanford for graduate school. Uh, and so when I was at graduate school here at Stanford, I wound up somewhat accidentally starting a software company. Um, so I was actually doing a consulting project for a venture capital firm and I was bemoaning the lack of good software for the PC. So I'm dating myself now. So the PC had just come out, okay? The PC had just come out and there Whoa, was- that, that must have been like centuries ago. I don't know what you're talking about. So you lost me there. You know, when I talk to my kids and I talk about the time frame before the iPad, they're like, well, I don't want to hear about it. It's too old, it's irrelevant. No, All right. I'm just kidding. Obviously, you want to hear about it. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, it was a long time ago. Uh, no, no, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> but in any case, so the PC had just come out. 
and uh, and I had uh, so I had learned all my my programming on on mini computers, basically on you know back mm-hmm. in the day using time sharing systems. That's how I learned to program. And right. and then this PC comes out, and I'm thinking, wow, this is so neat. You know, I'm going to have control over a computer. I don't have to dial in and do timeshare and all that sort of stuff that we used to do back in the dark ages, you know. And, um, and But there was no good software on the PC. I mean, they had, like, there was this spreadsheet thing called VisiCalc. There's another, there's another word that will date me. Um, but there was, there was no good application software. And so my buddy and I... Uh, we're, you know, we're talking about this with this VC and I said, you know, and, and the prophetic phrase that I uttered that, that they held over me forever was you to <laughs> back to, back to the original phrase. But the phrase I uttered was you'd have to be really stupid to lose money in PC software. And so the, P- the VC, the VC we were working with said, Bill, why don't you start a company to develop software for the PC? And I said, ah, oh, you know, I'm busy with graduate school. I got other things. And, oh, you know, so what I, I enrolled in the, so I enrolled in the entrepreneurship class and I wrote the business plan and took it back at to the Stanford, VC. Right? That was at Stanford? At Stanford, right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I took it back to the VC and um, <laughs> he said, okay, <laughs> So he's, this, is another, this is another hysterical history of venture capital. So he said, well, open a bank account, set up a bank account, and then call Carl. Carl was his, his director of finance. I said, so call Carl and tell him to fill it up. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, okay. and, I look, and I look at my partner. I mean, and we were so green. We were so green at the time. You know, obviously, obviously, a VC says something like that. You got to ask the question: What does that mean? <laughs> but yeah. instead, instead, we opened a bank account and we called Carl. And <laughs> it turned out that fill it. You know, we had all sorts of imagination. Fill it up meant six hundred thousand dollars. So it's not bad, right? So, in the eighties, it's a lot of money. No, no, no. It was it was great. Um, so, but it was so yes. So they 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 filled it up, and we launched this. We launched the company, um, and at the I was technically the second board meeting. The second board meeting, the um, the the VC says, "Okay, guess what, guys? We found you a CEO." And I look at my partner and we go, wait a second, we're, we're running the company. What do you mean you found us a CEO? <laughs> what? Yeah. We never asked like, for a CEO. Whoa. We never, yeah. you know, this is like, you know, VC, uh, you know, 101, right? Um, be careful what you wish for. And, mm. and they said, yeah, yeah, we found this guy. His name is Mike. And they described Mike. And we're sitting there thinking, so it turns out Mike is this old fart who you know Surprise they're bringing them. in? You know, yeah, you know he was he does, like he doesn't know anything about technology, but right. he's been doing this for thirty years, and uh, well, it, he's been on uh, the Time Magazine probably. Oh, so whatever. Time, one day. Well, so t- to be honest, so it turned out you know for us, old for Mike was thirty-five, right? Oh, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that, <laughs> and so we thought, ooh, you yes. know, this is back. Back in the era where, you know, don't trust anyone over 30 was still, was was still, still, uh, still resonating. <laughs> I think we, but, we're getting there again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but in any case, so one thing led to another and it turned out Mike was brilliant. And, um, uh, but we wound up, um, we wound up becoming the first app, the first app developers for the PC. So what we so we we morphed the business model instead of designing and building our own software what we did is we built the first contact management software for Rolodex. Oh, so I see. Okay. Rolodex said, "Hey, I wonder if you could put your contacts on a PC." And we said, "Sure." And we built them the software for con- for managing your contacts on a PC. Great idea, right? And then yeah. Charles then Charles Schwab came along and said, I wonder if people want to manage their money on a PC. And so we said, sure. And we wrote the software to manage for Charles Schwab, which became their first money manager uh, application. Right. 
So we did the first software for Rolodex, and then Charles Schwab came along, and yeah. and we did the first money manager software for Charles Schwab, and then Dow Jones came along, and Dow Jones wanted to build the Dow Jones accounting series for the PC. That right. for some reason Dow Jones had gotten into venture capital, and they wanted to get into this new tech world, right? So we. You know, we said sure, and so we started building the Dow Jones Accounting Series, and basically we designed QuickBooks. So this is before QuickBooks, okay. right? Yeah. But we yeah. designed QuickBooks, and because it was a PC, and <laughs> so it had to be something very lean, very light, in order to fit on the PC. Believe it or not, you were lucky to get five twelve K RAM on the machine, <laughs> and you did not have. You didn't have you didn't have hard drives built into PCs back then, right? Yeah. So yeah. it was a pretty different world. So we present this outline to to Dow Jones, and Dow Jones has one of the big accounting firms sort of blessing our spec, and the accounting firm said, "This is not a professional accounting system," and we said, "This is not a main this is not a mainframe computer. This is a PC." Yeah. They said, "Well." We can't put the Dow Jones name on this, you know, little light piece of software, and so we said okay, and we tried to design a sort of advanced accounting system for the PC, and it went on and on and on. And bottom line, bottom line, we couldn't make it work. And one day, right. Dow Jones came in and said, "We're taking over the company, and uh, you guys are out." And kaboom. Oh. Kaboom! It was like it, and the was whole in the, thing. In the nineties, or this is the mean? this is in the this is in the this is in the mid eighties, and oh, okay. so yeah. it was you know, and it, we you know, I went from being worth more than I ever imagined I would be worth on paper to all of that disappearing, and I had just yeah. I had just and I had just proposed to this woman that I was dating, <laughs> and. Um, and I was, you know, and I had to go back to her and say, you know, guess what? <laughs> you may think I'm rich, <laughs> but I just I want to let you back. know. <laughs> I need to downgrade it a lot. <laughs> yeah, and so, so the well, so the great, uh, the great news is that she married me anyway. Anyway, <laughs> so that is so we're news. still married. But and the good news, the good news, the great, the good news about Silicon Valley is when you crash and burn. In Silicon Valley, you pick yourself up and you dust yourself off, and you you know you spin the story a little bit, <laughs> and, yeah. and then you go do it again, and then you go do yeah. it again. So yeah. I was able to do it again, and we took the next company, we took it public, and so I thought I got this wired, and then I did it again, and had you know it was part of a team that was starting up this unbelievably cool um, um, tablet technology. Um, and um, it was way too early. It was way too early. And so we crashed that into a brick wall at 500 miles an hour. Um, so I gained a little modesty. And then I did it again and managed to uh, exit that company very nicely. And so then I got a call from a friend who said, yeah. hey, Bill, how would you like to start a venture capital firm? And so that's when I got together with Guy Kawasaki and a few other people, and we started Garage Technology Ventures. And so yeah. we did wanted, you, yeah, yeah. Uh, did you raise some funds for for Garage Technology in the beginning, or was that you? Yeah, was that you only? <laughs> um, no, we. Um, so you know, the big idea behind Garage was to be the farm team for Silicon for Sand Hill Road. And so oh, we've okay. got money. We got money from Sequoia and Mayfield and Draper Fisher Jurvetson and Highland mm -hmm. Capital and Silicon Valley Bank and Advanced Technology Ventures. And we got, you know, a bunch of money from a whole bunch of people to find the next big thing. Okay. And so yeah. the big idea behind Garage was the next big thing wasn't necessarily here in Silicon Valley. The next big thing might be anywhere in the world. And yeah. so our mission in Garage was to be the most outreach oriented, the most entrepreneur friendly venture capital firm 
in Silicon Valley. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, interesting. Very interesting. So, so that was the big idea. One of our one of our um, one of our mantras was we take the fu out of funding. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is good. And, you know, do- <laughs> I, I remember from the day Guy Guy was was kind of this this social media star before social media existed, right? He he had right. this appearance and this cloud. Um, I'm not sure if people still 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 remember that. Certainly, in, it's it's a bit of our generation or um, uh, a generation a little ago. Um, it's it, it what would we feel like was a I don't know. I don't want to say Jared Kushner Kushner, but I want to say um, <laughs> maybe in between and uh, what's what's PB by the the most famous YouTuber. I'm always here, but I can't remember his, his handle. Um, okay, I feel he was he was in between those, right? He he got a, he got a huge cloud, and he he was on the magazine cover, and uh, he yeah. was everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So he gets you know he got credit for being. Um, he got he got credit for being the guy who sort of created evangelism in the software yeah. world, and he yeah. is very quick. He's very quick, you know, while he was at Apple, and he's very quick to point out that he wasn't the one who invented evangelism. He was just the one who popularized it by writing a book called The Macintosh Way, and so yeah. <clears throat> you know, sort of in the history of Silicon Valley, um, Hewlett Packard was sort of the first generation big dog in Silicon Valley, and somebody, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember who, uh, but somebody, when we were coming up, somebody wrote a book called The HP Way, which was intended to be sort of this, this inside look at why and how HP was so different from every other traditional corporation. And, you know, HP yeah. invented this thing called management by walking around and everybody lived in an open cubicle. There were no closed offices. And so HP had this cult around it um, sort of the decade before Apple. And then and then Guy brilliantly um, stole that and wrote a book called The Macintosh Way, which mm-hmm. was sort of the combination of the Macintosh group and all the cult behind that, as well as sort of the, the Steve Jobs approach to, to sort of innovation and, and managing teams and, and developing new products. Um, so that yeah. put Guy on the map in terms of, of his, his popularity. And then yeah. he had a regular column in Mac World, and he was always a keynote at the, you know, Mac Expos and, and so Apple and Macintosh, you know, and Guy sort of helped each other become, you know, sort of globally visible. And then so when yeah. we started Garage, when we started Garage, Guy was writing his, was finishing up, I think it was his fourth book, um, called Rules for Revolutionaries. And, and so, God bless him, he got his publisher to advance him you know, three hundred thousand dollars, and we used that money to launch Garage to promote oh, cool. the yeah. whole Garage. You know, the whole Garage story, and yeah. uh, and that was so we launched we launched Garage alongside Rules for Revolutionaries, and that you know rocketed us to um, to global visibility. You know, very very quickly. Um, yeah. So. That was the that was the part of the origin story um, of of Garage. And it's really um, interesting. And then I, I know you. Uh, I saw another video of yours where you you're kind of critical of entrepreneurs. You probably must have seen thousands um, over the years and, and millions of business plans. Wait, I'm Being never the, critical of entrepreneurs. <laughs> that, Carson, well, how can I, you so, say I'm critical of entrepreneurs? See, I find I find all these okay, things. Okay, come on. Okay, come on. You know, Bill bring Wright, it on. The top top ten lies um, <laughs> of entrepreneurs. Okay, all right. And so you so, understand. There's a difference between being critical and tough love. Uh, so it was always, idiot. always tough love. Okay, always tough yeah. love. But keep going, keep going. <laughs> well, what I wanted to get at is, I, 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 so I read that article and I'm like, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, entrepreneurs, they are great, but they can obviously, we, we can call it Donald Trump syndrome. They can kind of get ahead of themselves, right? They're too 
too well, boorish. They can they can be too crazy. Um, there's lots of ways they can be deceitful. Uh, they can they can be too boastful. There's lots of these things, and I think everyone who has entrepreneurial genes knows that this is happening to them sooner or later. And you can you can obviously um, modify that, and you can reduce that ability in yourself. But that's a big problem. I think everyone in your position has to deal with. So I don't actually want to worry too much about the entrepreneurs. Um, I think we both agree on this. But I wanted to to I wanted to ask you if you have like the top ten lies of investors, primarily venture capital investors. Yes. Do they ever lie? And if they do, <laughs> what would be the top ten lies? Yeah, 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 yeah. So okay, so you are t- you're touching on you know one of our themes, but yes, so very you know very very early on in, in um, at Garage, after listening to thousands of pitches. <clears throat> we realized that one of the challenges entrepreneurs have is if you are truly a passionate entrepreneur, you are almost certainly pathologically optimistic. So yeah. now, if you are now if you are pathologically if you're pathologically optimistic, you're going to have a tendency to blur the line between what you hope will happen and what you know will happen. Right? Of course. <laughs> and yes. so. And so there is a tendency, and that's the point of the top 10 lies, there's a tendency for entrepreneurs to exaggerate. And so that's what yeah. came out. So we, yeah. we started, we started tongue-in-cheek, we started presenting at our conferences the top 10 lies of entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. And so finally, you know, it was, it, it was funny that it took this long, but, you know, I don't know, maybe it was six months. And an entrepreneur finally said, wait a second, Bill, what about, what about the top 10 lies of VCs? Yes. You know, why don't you guys? So we then produced, they, we then produced the top 10 lies of VCs. So okay. we have, yes. if you go to the Garage website, you will see both the top 10 lies of entrepreneurs and you will see the top 10 lies of VCs. You've got me. But, Nothing is original here. Nothing is original. <laughs> so yeah, we did... Someone- we yeah. did the top ten lies of VCs, and I, you know, I, I, you know, I could probably eventually get to tw- all twenty of them if I thought long enough. <laughs> right now, yeah, but, I, I, you know, I was just curious if, if there's something no. that comes to mind where you feel, you know, yeah. that's that it's both sides have a lot to lie about. But Absolutely, both, both sides also, and it's a miracle that they they become so honest because you know the <laughs> entrepreneurial incentive is you just make up some story and. Uh, you you present it well. There's some good slides, some nice design, and right. it's completely bogus. But it sounds so convincing. Think of Theranos, um, and uh, it's there's a huge incentive to lie because suddenly there's yeah. going to be a few billion dollars on your bank account, and yeah. the VCs say, "Oh, it's not my money. It's not. I'm really not worried about it. I'm just mm. feeding you. I have some duty, but you know, really, right. um, it was a bad we wanted to make." On, right. on the other hand, side there's the, the the venture capital investor who right. has a has a lot of incentive and also has the power in that moment is this, this corporate structure and this 50 years of experience per person and there's like several venture partners and there's an right. entrepreneur who's in his 20s or maybe in right. his 30s, doesn't right. have a ton of experience. You tell them, oh, we just show him a little carrot and say there's some money. Right. But actually, this person will never make money from his own venture even if it goes becomes, goes IPO. So mm. the, the, both sides have a lot of, you know, they have this, this, this information advantage on each side. And I'm surprised there is so much honesty in this game. You, you would assume both sides lie constantly, right? That's what I would assume. Well, There's a reputation yeah. to it. But, you know, you know what, do, what did this investor know about something you did yeah. in China five, yeah. five years ago? They don't know yeah. much. Or in Russia. Maybe you <clears> wanted <throat> in Russia for drug offenses. Nobody really knows that. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, uh, so... There, there's no question that there are that on all sides there are bad actors, you know, and that are that you know, there and it's significant, but it's still a corner case. I mean, the Theranoses of the world, the Adam Newmans of the world, the WeWorks of the world, uh, you know, and then you know a few cases, and uh, you know the guys, the guys that let them get away with it. Um, and sometimes the the VCs that that's, that screw entrepreneurs, you know, there are there are those there are those situations, uh, and um, and so there's there's no question that that is a that is a real issue um, in our world. 
but it's an issue of the, you know, it is an issue of the business world that is not unique to venture capital. And Absolutely. what I do think is somewhat unique to venture capital is your point is the degree to which there is trust between sides, the degree to which people do strike deals with so many uncertainties unresolved. So typically in the corporate world, you don't strike a deal without putting hundreds of hours of lawyer work in, you know, dotting I's and crossing T's in this complex contracts. Whereas in venture yeah. capital, you know, the basis on which we move forward is is unbelievably open ended in terms of yeah. Yeah. you know both you know both sides, but both but it is both sides, and you know sometimes expectations become misaligned, and so you wind up having a problem. You know, the one of the top ten one of the top ten VC lies is, I back my entrepreneurs a hundred percent. Yeah, and, for the first two you know, weeks, right? You know, and the VC, yeah, and the VC lie is the next sentence, which is um, until the day I fire them, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, well, right? They say so you have about a year, from what I remember from my from my venture back started. This is about a week, and uh, sorry, about a year, and then you're honestly being reevaluated and reviewed. I think for yeah. the first three to six months, you can kind of do whatever you want. Well, I, you know, but I, well, I told you the story of my first startup. And, you know, the second yeah. board meeting, the VC says, hey, we have a CEO for you. That was in the 80s. That's different. That's different. <laughs> I, I was surprised you know. they had venture capital at the time. <laughs> but it was, yes, but it, it, was, it was sort of, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, 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 emblematic of some of the issues between entrepreneurs and VCs in terms of clarity of expectations. So that's always, you know, that, that can frequently become an issue. And almost always when there is a big battle, it's because of the lack of clarity of expectations, you know, from one side or to one side to the, from one side to the other. But but yes, you know, I mean, there but, is. But a everyone surprising... wants to. Yeah, everyone has an incentive to cheat. That's what I'm. What I'm. What I'm trying to get at. And um, well, but what, everyone what has a. But but you know, there is a there is a governor on the whole on the whole mechanism. You know, which is mm -hmm. reputation, and right. you know, and 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 so we, as on the VC side and on the entrepreneur side, you know, on the entrepreneur side. Um, you know, my opportunity to do the next great thing was dependent upon my reputation and, you know, from the last thing I did. And so, you know, I was half joking about in Silicon Valley, when you crash and burn, you can just pick yourself up, you know, spin the story and then do it again. Um, you know, VCs look into that. You know, I, why did that company fail? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so... I I, I think I think this is a big problem when we when you think about crowdfunding, and I wanted to get your opinion on this. Oh yeah, um, you know, crowdfunding is something that seems extremely uh, hot right now, and uh, you, the the ability for startups not just to raise it used to be limited to about a million dollars, and now you can go up to seventy five million dollars, and mm -hmm. it's basically direct consumer transactions. Everyone can just make almost like a donation. It starts with five dollars, goes up to a few thousand dollars. And you can, that was never before possible, strangely enough, to, to be honest. Um, how do you feel, yeah. A, will that go in the next few years? Or how does this compete with you guys? And B, how do you think reputation as a governor, as you say, which I think is absolutely true, that works in Silicon Valley, will that also work for crowdfunding? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, <clears throat> you know, yes, crowdfunding is out there. But I'll tell you, um, the only, you know, the only sort of intersection between crowdfunding and venture capital is, is really when we see a company that has, you know, has depended upon crowdfunding to get to where they are, um, it's generally not a great sign. Um, so... We, we do not particularly cross paths with the crowdfunding world. And so what has happened um, 
you know, my, my observation is that the only companies, you know, very, very few companies are successful um, based upon crowdfunding. The ones that are, the ones that are, are not the, are not the equity crowdfunding sites. It's the ones that are product crowdfunding successes where they've launched a product on Kickstarter or Indiegogo and what they've gotten is customer validation. So there have been a number of companies that have launched using product crowdfunding as a basis for validating their you know, product market fit. Um, and then they go to venture capital to get their equity. But you know, I, yeah, I, I can't off the top of my head think of a company that has been successful that has even started with crowdfunding, um, much less, you know, been successful with just crowdfunding. So you tell me. I mean, maybe I, I you know, I haven't, I haven't been on top of it. But where do you see crowdfunding making a dent in the venture world? Um, what I think, from my personal perspective, is the the whole crowdfunding is still relatively new, and most of the ability to raise that much money up to seventy five million dollars, it's only happening in January next year. And what what I feel it makes a big impact there is is this democratization. It's this ability to 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 reach out to your consumers, to the people who either love your product or often your product is not yet available, but you have an idea of a product, and then you use crowdfunding. Um, as a, as a mechanism to 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 monetize that expectation. Now, obviously, there's a lot of issues that uh, could become big issues in there. One is the reputation and the, the, the way to establish reputation is a big problem. It seems like there's more actors in there. And it's harder to distinguish who, what is a good company, what is a bad company. And then the other problem, obviously, is if, as you said earlier, if you're a consumer startup, why not just build a product and basically sell something to consumers and bootstrap your, your startup? That's kind of it's very similar to crowdfunding. Why give them equity? Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. not just be profitable? And that's true for a lot of companies. There was um, the software that's that's based in a software company. It's based in Prague um, that um, develops a um, big part of the operating system code, um, the, way, the way the operating system for Android is done. And they developed this, and Google eventually adopted this, and they bootstrapped their way to a few hundred developers, and they're doing hmm. just fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> again, we'll see. I think I think that equity crowdfunding will be very limited to um, a relatively narrow category of consumer goods, where the investors can understand what they're investing in. Um, yeah. Where there's some, you know, there's some, you know, clarity around the the idea of the product. It's you're not going to see crowdfunding in enterprise software, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's highly, yeah, you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. No, but it it's not going to be a significant. It's not going to be a that significant. Right. For sure, but we we feel like, or I feel that the adoption, the consumer adoption of new technology is is okay. is very was very selective and has has been slower than I would have anticipated 15, 20 years ago, and maybe the reason is because the VCs back the wrong startups. Think about that. Could be. <laughs> it's hard. To well, put I'm sorry. Up. I mean, you know, again, be yes, yes, most. VCs back a bunch of wrong startups, which comes out very yes. clearly in the in the statistics, right? So yeah. you know, take any given technology that's emerging, and you're going to have 10, 20, 30 VCs backing you know 30, 40, 50 different startups in the in the sector, and so you cannot suggest that venture capital is so is so closed that somehow it sucks all of the oxygen out of the room for innovators with new products or new ideas to offer to the world in such a way that in any way venture capital stifles innovation. Now you well, could argue you could argue yeah. that you know you could argue that Lyft is better than Uber and so you know, Lyft should have been more successful than Uber, but, you know, so we have both of them. 
but well, I mean, the, the, the yeah. parallels that people draw, and I think there's yeah. something to that argument, and I, I really want to talk to you about, I know that's yeah. something that is close to your heart. The, the arguments that people draw is kind of like the, the Google AdWords and Facebook marketing. They control 90% of online marketing. And we were like, yeah, they're just doing it well. But, you know, they, they've been, the, day the document came out that they've been working together behind the scenes for five years to, to, to establish a way and mechanism that they control the market, but it's not seen as antitrust. So they've actively mm-hmm. worked together for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, now, we could say oh, someone else could have done that market, and maybe there's an argument to this, but they achieved their goal, they have a monopoly. Mm-hmm. And we say, well, most of it, Google is free, right? But um, And the advertising is what it is. But if you mm-hmm. think about it, if you have advertising mechanism as an entrepreneur, you could launch an innovation. There were a lot of innovations in the, the last 20 years. The technological progress has been running the same way, more or less. But yeah. the consumer adoption has, has wasn't as strong. And my perception of this is, well, A, there was no marketing mechanism. A lot of stuff has gotten saturated and monopolies had been built by the startups from the 2000s that had this hangover of capital. And I think the, the VCs play a role in this, in this ecosystem. And then we talked about that last time. I feel the what's going on in public markets, you know, that there's this almost these exclusively these pipeline deals between companies that are a billion dollars and then again picked up by SoftBank. Um, the vision fund, and then they exit for 100 billion, you know, like Airbnb right. is probably mm-hmm. that example. But I always feel these are these are monopoly. This is a little bit like monopoly or oligopoly. Mm-hmm. So there's very yeah. few people involved in this whole market. And the, 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 the retail investor is kind of the, the idiot in that game. I mean, <clears> he gets in way too late, and the valuations are way too high. Mm-hmm. What I think, and maybe crowdfunding isn't the, isn't the tool for, for changing this, but I feel there is maybe a more democratization that happens, you know, at the early stage of the startup. And then you see yeah. a, t- a lot of entrepreneurs being able to push out their, their startup. Obviously, it can be bought maybe by by a company that's not a bad thing. But being able to yeah. bring their startup without huge investment rounds, without SoftBank, going public a couple of years later. Uh, that's odd. It hasn't really happened the last 10 years. You will have examples where it did happen. But mm-hmm. there's something in this value chain from, like, ID generation to going IPO is not as ideal as it could be. Let's put it this way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I so I, I do think some of the things you're talking about are failures of capitalism in in a larger, you know, sort of marketplace sense, as distinct from being failures of venture capital. So, uh, you know, the issue, economists and Theoreticians generally agree that 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 you know market-based capitalism will have a tendency to drift toward extremes that could be not in the best interest of consumers, and so yeah. that was the whole idea. That was the whole idea between behind you know antitrust, anti-monopoly uh, legislation a hundred some years ago. So the the question, you know, and now this is kind of resurfacing, you know, because in in some level, you know, Facebook and Google represent a relatively small part of the advertising world, but they represent a dominant part of the digital advertising world, right? Yeah. So um, and so, is that a monopoly or not? You know, it's pretty clear at some level there are sort of monopoly threats associated with Google's dominance or Facebook's dominance. It's not crystal clear, though. It's not crystal clear who is getting harmed. Um, and well, it's the, not... the consumer is harmed because innovation is more expensive. Well, so well yeah, that's the question. Expensive. Why is it? Why, that's a strong give me argument. A, mm-hmm. Well, I, so I haven't seen the strong argument that innovation is being harmed because Google and Facebook both now as global platforms, they give me as an innovator a platform in which I can distribute my innovation almost for free globally. How would I have done that in a pre-Google Facebook world? How would I have been able to reach the rest of the world if it had not been for this you know, sort of pervasiveness of this digital network that has connected you know, four billion people. I hear you, Bill, and you're absolutely <laughs> right. But the the argument you're making is a little stationary. It's kind of like you know, I grew up in Eastern Germany, and we had we had cars, 
And people would tell us, do you want a car now? And we're like, yeah, but you know, this car looks like 50 years ago and we had better cars before the second world war. And people <laughs> said, are like, yeah, do you want a car? Or do you want to walk? And we're like, okay, give me a car. <laughs> <laughs> you know okay. it's, it's a car it's better than not having a car 100 yeah. percent. but could there be a better car yes and you right. only know this because you looked into another country now google and, and facebook have right. been pretty successful and as an entrepreneur i want to build the next monopoly i'm not interested in building competitive businesses i want to build a monopoly <laughs> right and i want to sell right. it and exactly. bring it up here. so no right. i mean this i'm not i'm not faulting anyone at this well what what i'm faulting people is in the sense of we had the fat policy and that really happened only in the 90s right really circumstantial and that we keep printing that money and we don't let anyone go bankrupt anymore and not ltc and not lehman brothers we don't let the airlines go bankrupt i'm Maybe sorry bankrupt. no the mistake we made by the way just to remember history the mistake we made is that we did let lehman brothers go bankrupt that okay. is what caused that that is what caused the you know the meltdown if we had only bailed out lehman brothers it would have been much less painful but I'm not, I'm not okay. in, you know, I'm not in favor of bailing everybody out. And I'm just saying, but clearly there's a failure to capitalism here that you are pointing out that, yeah. you know, but, but, and I, I don't disagree that it, that, that monopoly represents a failure of some sort, but on the other hand, it's, you know, it's, it doesn't hurt everyone equally. It hurts sure. some, you know, it benefits overwhelmingly most people but there is some there are some people potentially whom it hurts and so now the question is you know how do you rectify that how do you how do you and, and how do you identify it because it's yeah. sort of uh, um you know it's, it's a first a, world problem I'm, i mean i'm fully with well you. it's a first no, world problem right and then if you go to even most places in europe and yeah. developed economies and japan even doesn't have venture capital what they came up with is all the printed money from from their own central bank, and they were able to put it in the fund, and then they barely made any investments in, in Japan. All that money yeah. went in Europe or in Africa. All that money yeah. went into pre-NASDAQ companies. So they they aren't they aren't they aren't idiots, right? They know what they're doing, and they been, <laughs> they say they have been manipulating the US the NASDAQ market because it's so big, and they bought call options. Right. Who knows? Yeah, but yeah. you know, I'm they they're, they're, they're good business in the sense that they want to make money for the investors, and I'm not faulting them at all. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying, for the ecosystem and for the long-term innovation, maybe we've gone slightly on the wrong track. And the, as you say, how do we put this on the right track again? Yeah. So we have a yeah. widespread entrepreneurship value yeah. in society, yeah. but also going all the way to, it doesn't have to be a public, but yeah. a, you know, a useful liquid exit market. Yeah. Well, and, 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 you know, I mean, let me brag that I believe, <laughs> I, I fervently believe that I am on the right side of history in this regard, in yeah. terms of the mission, you know, the mission of Garage was to democratize venture capital, was yeah, to exactly. extend yeah. venture capital to beyond Silicon Valley. Our mission was, hey, there's plenty of guys here in Silicon Valley working the Silicon Valley scene. Why don't we take advantage of our Silicon Valley roots and connections to connect entrepreneurs elsewhere in the world into the Silicon Valley ecosystem. And then that mission is extended in Pegasus Tech Ventures by multiple factors. Pegasus, you know, Pegasus is a $1.5 billion global venture fund that runs the biggest startup competition on the planet. So, wow. you know, in the last year, we've done over 60 regional competitions to try to find the best entrepreneurs in every region of the world, including, you know, sort of all the developed world, but also in Africa, in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in Latin America. So we are, I mean, we now it's purely self-interest. I get it. <laughs> it's purely self-interest. Well, that's good, right? I think I trust self-interest way more than uh, the opposite. Because if, if you don't know exactly. why people behave not self-interested, there's something going on and you're probably the patsy. Right. And or or, you know, it's some government that's trying to win political favor and wasting taxpayer about dollars. Right. So I am it's good if you, if, I'm, within, within restrictions, but making money is good. So I'm I am, you know, a fervent believer in the idea of of, you know, 
capitalism and self-interest and finding the best entrepreneurs with the best ideas and the best emerging technologies wherever they are on the planet and enabling and 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 what we've seen happen is by enabling ecosystems in different parts of the planet you know enabling southeast asia to develop all of these um, amazing entrepreneurs that have that have that have bred these fantastic businesses in southeast asia that are actually very unique to southeast asia you know payments in southeast asia is different than payments in the developed world, right? And and ride sharing is different, right? Yeah. Nobody nobody in San Francisco is going to ride share on the back of a motorbike, right? <laughs> but, I, but I didn't do it in Tijuana either. Uh, I think it's, <laughs> Gojek is crazy, and uh, Grab is just cra as crazy. And uh, right, um, right. So it's you know I don't know how people do that. Yeah. So the diffusion of the venture capital model around the world has been unbelievably beneficial for entrepreneurs and innovators and societies and consumers yes. in all of these countries where you know um, you know Silicon Valley technology is not going to permeate you know as quickly as locally grown technology that's that 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 is localized for the needs of the local you know of the local market i mean yep. yes american fintech companies have tried to take credit cards all over the world but credit cards are a you know are a, a limited <laughs> technology for you know the 21st century and so yep. all of these ecosystems have developed much better payment systems than you know the the developed world credit card system um yeah. for yeah, we totally have been uh, I, well, yeah. um yeah right the, and, and but also cell phones when you go to korea you, you realize that 5g and the way they, they deal with um, bigger devices and faster devices they've always been five years ahead and the samsung's we yeah. get i feel like our generation are too behind that's the, nobody uses that in, in korea anymore yeah um so from, from, i mean but so complaining about Google yeah. and Facebook, yes, there's there's reason to complain. But that it's like complaining about Theranos and WeWork. I mean, okay. they are they, you know they're legitimate issues to talk about, but it's not core. I don't think it's not core to the idea of venture capital and the practice of venture capital. Yeah, but from okay. your from your own experience, when you when you look at the startups over the years. Yeah. What was something where you felt, whoa, I didn't expect that, but it was a great success, and vice versa, where you said, okay, this is a slam dunk, but it didn't uh -huh. go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is um, the, uh, um, oh, there's a term we use, and I'm, I'm forgetting it right now, for the, for the, you know, the negative portfolio, the portfolio okay. that you that you had a chance to build, but you did not build, right? Um, and then there's right. the, you know, and then the, there are the companies that you, we invested in that we thought were slam dunks that it turned out they weren't. But, you know, sort of my, my, first, <laughs> my first significant um, uh, sort of example of that was actually my third startup, which I, I, I started to touch base on. Um, but so after, after my second company went public, I jumped into this company that had developed an entirely new kind of personal computer. And so I imagine this, okay? Imagine this. It's just a piece of glass. And Ooh, you interact cool. with it by touching the screen. And there's no Ooh. keyboard. And that was... And okay, so it, so the year is so the year is 1990, <laughs> and yeah. and we had a team out of SRI that had come up with this idea for a tablet computer that was taking advantage of this new technology that had just come out called the touch screen. Yeah, and the Newton, right? Wasn't it Newton? <laughs> it something well, that was that time, you're later. actually oh. you're actually getting ahead of the story. So, oh, okay, sorry. so I met sorry. these guys. I met these guys, and you know, I'm just coming off of of my IPO, and I think I, you know they show me what they're building. And I think this is this is the coolest thing I have ever seen, and. Yeah. 
And, you know, so we mock this thing up and, um, and I, t- <laughs> and we get, you know, Bill Gates comes down from Redmond to take a look at what we're doing. And, you know, the guys from Sequoia come in to take a look at what we're doing. And it turns out there were three of us at the time. There were three companies that were developing this tablet computer idea um, in, you know, right at the same time. And, um, I, and so I take this mock-up and I go around the country <clears throat> and I show this mock-up to, to traders, to engineers, to real estate people, to delivery companies, to architects, to, um, uh, you know, you name bankers. So I took it all around. We figured, you know, the, the go-to-market was going to have to be to business. It had to be a business computer because we already knew it was too expensive for consumers. Um, and, you know, what I found out was, so the problem was the touchscreen back then, in order to make a touchscreen for a tablet computer, the touchscreen alone cost $1,100 out of Taiwan, you know, and, and then you had to have a whole computer behind it. Right. (laughs) So, um, well, that's, that's a problem with, with, you know, very expensive surface mount technology to compact everything. It was all, you know, pushing the state of the art back then. And so we thought, eh, maybe we could go to market at a $5,000 retail price. We get a little bit of market, you know, get a little bit of margin. And everybody I talked to, when they heard the price, they said, well, okay, we'll buy one, right? (laughs) 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 So I go back, I go back to the office and I say, guys, we got a big, 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 big problem here. Um, Nobody's going to pay $5,000 for this thing. And one of the engineers, one of the engineers has this brainstorm and his brainstorm was, um, now, do you know what the, do you, have you ever heard the word filofax? Do you know what a filofax was? Does that ring any bells? So no. uh, in the States, it's a British term. It's a British term for a product that in the States, we called it a day timer. Um, uh-huh. But back in the olden days, okay, <laughs> I'm dating myself again. Back in the olden days, we used to keep like our schedules, our calendars. We would have these, you know, we would have these little notebooks and we would write yeah. down appointments, right? And in the okay. back of the notebook, we would have our contacts. We would write down phone numbers, right? And then we would have note pages and we would write down notes. And so this is a filofax. And so our, the engineer comes in with his filofax, which is this fat leather bound thing stuffed with notes and whatever. He drops it on the, he drops it on the conference table and says, what if we do that? And so his big idea was, what if we shrink the computer, we shrink it down to, you know, sort of a a smaller device where you could keep your contacts and you could keep your calendar and you could keep, you know, your notes and things like that. And because the cost of the touchscreen was reduced by the square of the diameter, we could Mm -hmm. make it, we could make it for like $400. Um, and sell it for maybe six hundred dollars, and that was the big idea. And okay, so that's a good one. you would think. And so we call back the Sequoia guys, and um, oh, Jean Louis Gasset, Jean Louis Gasset, he comes in, and he looks at our new idea, and he says, "Well, okay, this is this is a little bit, maybe it's not politically correct, but Jean Louis Gasset is French, right?" So Jean-Louis Gasset comes in and he looks at our, you know, prototype and he says, uh, that is not a computer, that is a toy. It's <laughs> like, oh, it is not a toy. But in any case, um, so that was, the, that was the end of that. So the team, the engineering team, then yeah. went to Apple and built the Newton. Okay. And that's... Okay. That's the story of my first big, I thought it was inevitable. I thought there was no question the world would like just unbelievably embrace this tablet computer idea. I did and, it, right? <laughs> Sometimes you're too early and that happens. There's nothing you right. can do about that. 
You don't yeah. want to be too late, but you also don't want to be too early. <laughs> right. But nobody knows, right? It's, it's yes. a crap sure. This whole venture capital right. timing thing is a big problem. Like we can right. predict things 200 years out uh, with certainty, probably. There's some yeah. certainty, but, yeah. but you can't do the next 15 years or 20 right. years. Yeah. No, but a point you've made is that we have this we have this sort of interesting optimism about the speed of technological adoption. Um, but in fact, in fact, it takes much longer for the market to adopt things that we imagine than we hope, which is why every entrepreneur gets their numbers wrong. Because well, there we is have- social, yeah, There's a social component to all this, right? And I think this is, this is I think, why, why I'm more hopeful suddenly now um, yeah. is this, the social component of how do we up, update our model of reality? And this goes into wow. politics, it goes wow. into <laughs> social interaction, this goes into, um, it goes into pretty much anything around us. And that used to yeah. follow a certain cycle. And that cycle is based basically on the people we know and the people we trust. So most yeah. of our family and friends. So if they right. update their cycle pretty quick, have a quick update cycle, we're going to have a quick update cycle. They're slow, ours is slow. There's always people who want to be a little ahead, and then there's people who want to be a little behind, see if this is safe, it makes sense. Right. And I see this in my own family, right? Everyone is uh-huh. on a different scale there, even if we are one family. Right. And we What we've seen is that for in, in general, especially the last 10 years with this distribution of, of knowledge out there, and there's so much knowledge suddenly available for free, um, that people have decided to update their knowledge. And that update cycle has really gone up. And you can say, oh, it's all just surface level? Maybe, because, but nobody or only very few people have the time and the intellect to look deeper into these issues. So the update cycle has finally yeah. uh, gone up. And w- what that means is that the, uh, w- which, which I felt was pre-COVID, maybe it wasn't enough, that feels you're more hungry for new technologies because A, you have more time or you feel like your friends are already using it. So these adoptions can spread faster. And I think this is a right. very positive note. Um, I right. feel we may be already behind the, the last 15 years of darkness, so to speak, always relative first world problem, right? If you go to Ethiopia, none of this matters. But um, it is something that should, that matters to us because we have to grow our own GDP. But now we see this, this when we had this period of GDP growth slowing down despite technological progress. So I feel maybe we're already seeing in COVID, weirdly enough, gives us this trigger, is this catalyst to really push up this GDP growth because our technology adoption, and not just the technological progress, but the adoption goes up. That's kind of my hopeful message. But for this, we need a lot of entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs who see the future, see how this technology particularly works, see how we can actually sell it and bring it to a wider marketplace. Well, Torsten, to your, you know, to that point, there have never been more entrepreneurs pursuing more innovations in more different parts of our world geographically, or in more different parts of our world in terms of of life, you know, in terms of segments, um, yeah. right? So, I mean, the per, the you know, you 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 look back twenty years ago. And venture capital and innovation as a as a sector was tiny, tiny, tiny. I mean, we had you know we had a lot of sort of vis- visibility because of the bubble, um, yeah. but in the grand scheme of things, we weren't doing much. I mean, what we did was yeah, we put a lot of information on the internet and we figured out how to sell things on the internet. But yeah. you know, in terms of fundamental fundamental innovation. You know, we were the, the the corners of the world were being barely touched, but yeah. you know, energy tech wasn't being. You know, twenty years ago there wasn't clean tech. I mean, I was in ed tech. Um, you know, before the bubble, and ed tech has proceeded unbelievably slowly over the last twenty years. Um, yeah. So we didn't have much in the way of ag tech. Um, you know, food delivery, people tried to do food delivery 20 years ago, but, you know, we, we didn't have smartphones back then. And so it was a little bit tougher. So it's, it's, but it's been, you know, now technology and innovation and all of this infrastructure that enables us to innovate and market products, you know, has, has just never been bigger. So, so, I mean, you, 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 you express concern over sort of innovation being stifled 
or the adoption. Sort of... What's the adoption? I, I don't think the innovation. I mean, the innovation okay. happens one way or another. And um, yeah, the the uh, you know we talked about that. I see Ray Kurzweil's idea, and that's the Moore's law. And then all this group, not all the scripted critics, just come through exactly. But we we saw. Apple being sort of satisfied with Intel, and Intel was the, the innovator for so long. And then now Apple realized Intel is actually slowing us down, so they just dropped it. And you know, within uh -huh. two years or less than that, I developed a much faster CPU for much lower price. So more mm -hmm. is true again. And that perspective, if you really focus on that only perspective, which isn't what we should do. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 pros, the progress is there, but I felt like the last 15 or even 50 years, we had a lot, exception in the 90s, most of the 90s, we we didn't we didn't change our lives from what the seventies and we had a lot of people who were entrepreneurs, people who came back from the war, who were who were exposed to technology, exposed to a lot right. of violence, but also a lot of technology and a lot of again a lot of these military values of we, we wanna build something, we wanna we wanna adopt I call them old testament values. I just talked to Kelly about that. And mm -hmm. They came back wanted to be entrepreneurs. I know this is a white a white um, angle I'm taking. We wanted to be entrepreneurs. We built something. And in the 70s, it, yeah. was, it was a little later. Everyone was a little richer. The, the next generation was around. And what happened is a little bit, A, that spirit of being an entrepreneur. I'm not saying it's it, it, that can be a necessity entrepreneur. You don't have to go IPO to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. It's a very yeah, Silicon yeah. Valley idea, right? Right. I don't right. think that's, that's, right. That's, 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 that's the useful comparison we should take. Although this is great. Um, and the, the idea is that you have a wide percentage of the population who is very entrepreneurial. A, B, you, you, you find the, the consumer base and companies to be relatively open to new innovation, either by force or by cultural values, by force in yeah. terms of competition. And um, once you do this, you can change the world. But look at the airplanes. They're kind of the same as what we had in the 70s. You look at the <laughs> cars, they're the same as huh? in the 70s. Now, you, obviously, you can give me 50 examples where things have changed. Yeah. But if you really look at look beyond finance and semiconductors, it, it gets harder and harder to find these examples. They're they're there, I'm sure. But from from my point of view, and when you look back into science fiction literature, or if you talk yeah. to people who, who were in the seventies and were entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs in the seventies, they feel like, hmm, you know what? Maybe I expect them too much, but this is not what I thought was is gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so I, I both I, I, I both I agree with you violently and I disagree with you violently. <laughs> <Honestly. Okay. laughs> you uh, know, you and so opinions. That's yeah. What well, okay. Yes. So here's 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 where I agree with you violently, and that is, um, and what I didn't mention is my undergraduate degree was in the history of science, mm -hmm. and 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 actually, uh, you know, I started. Um, yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah. I actually was going to go into, I thought I was going to go into genetics. Um, okay. and instead I went into international relations and I wound up studying, um, technology transfer and of all things, nuclear proliferation. But, um, the, but, but, you know, sort of having that frame on the world, one of the things that, that I did, one of the things I did when 2001 rolled around um, for, you know, for those of us who saw the movie 2001 when we were little kids and we thought that we would be able to go to the moon by 2001, when 2001 came along, I was incredibly pissed off, right? Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, and then actually, so subsequently Peter Thiel gets credit for this quote, you know, we were promised flying cars, and instead we got whatever. I can't even remember the quote. But, um, but, but your point, I mean, so we had in the post-war era, in the post-war era, we had this unbelievable Cambrian explosion of fundamental invention. I mean, yes. it's amazing the things that have been invented. You know, a lot of them were sort of invented, you know, with the war, but during the post-war era, and, you know, obviously we talk about things, you know, the obvious thing, things are things like computers, computing, um, you know, roughly electronic computers came out of the war, um, and then transistors right after the war, um, and then sort of there was an evolution of, of, of telecommunications technology, and, and eventually we got to cell phones in the 70s. 
But and then you had, you know, obviously nuclear power, which is a mixed blessing of some sort. But and then battery technology. I mean, just it, unbelievable all the all the inventions that happened um, after the war. And interestingly, um, and this is something I haven't figured out how to quantify, but it seems like we had unbelievable invention happening sort of through genomics into the early 2000s. But, and I picked 2008 as an arbitrary cutoff point because of the meltdown. But since 2008, you know, we didn't, we haven't invented jet airplanes. We haven't invented color TVs. We haven't invented smartphones. We haven't invented cell phones. Um, you know, we haven't invented uh, genetic engineering. We haven't invented, um, uh, you know, container ships. We, I mean, we haven't invented supersonic transport. We haven't invented, you know, we haven't invented much. Nah. Our I children, can't. right? Which it's like we have a new LSD for our children. <laughs> So again, Torsten, I'm not. I'm, I'm barely hearing you. What I wanted to to, to pick up on, and, and, and I feel like this is something that we, we see in this pattern. Basically, and okay. it goes through universities. Uh, that seems to have kicked off what happened during after the Second World War. Right? We took all this technology that wasn't actually planned to have any commercial use. Um, it was available kind of for free. Everyone could just build on it. And then we built something um, on top of that, which, which, which started that revolution that we've seen for uh, The book that I just read is called The Entrepreneurial State that kind of makes a similar argument that says, you know, basically all the iPhone and all the value that's being sold is coming from innovations that, that were funded by the government. That's the internet. There's, and there's some truth to this, right? A lot of this mm -hmm. is DARPA funded. So if you, because we have layers, you can always go back to a layer that's tax funder, a tax. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. And I'm not, an, I'm not an advocate of this, but it seems to, from the outside, it seems like, man, we need to invest more in, in basic research. And in a grand scale, I'm talking 10, 15% GDP and really yeah. make these scientists rich. And then basically give, to public domain and then let them let VCs come in and monetize it, let entrepreneurs come in. So I think I got most of what you said. Um, and I think what you're saying, I, I think I agree with, with what you were saying, which is that, that there has been, it, it feels as though the, the, the fundamental innovation, the fundamental invention the fundamental basic research that has generated the technologies on which innovative companies have been built has is being depleted or it's getting stale because we're not developing enough new fundamental technology. Um, and that should wind up slowing down um, both innovation and productivity and GDP growth. Um, you know, but the... The thing that, so I, I, I broadly agree with it. Um, you know, it is, it is the case, and one of the things I like to point out to, to entrepreneurs um, and other observers is if you look at the success of Silicon Valley um, and you look at all the unicorns and all the global brand name companies that came out of Silicon Valley, virtually none of them, very, very few Silicon Valley successes have been built on technology that the company invented, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. So, um, and in fact, you know, I can, I can, I can only think of two and possibly three, depending upon how you count. But, but Intel did invent the microprocessor, so you know mm -hmm. they get credit for that. Cisco did invent the router, um, so they get they get credit for that. And now, you know. Whether or not Genentech invented or stole their fundamental technology is an open mm -hmm. question, question. But yeah. you know, we'll Genentech, Genentech, you know, invented some some interesting stuff. But you know, Oracle didn't invent anything. Apple didn't invent anything. Google didn't invent anything. Facebook didn't invent anything. You know, so so really, none of the Fang guys really invented anything, right? They just yeah. innovated on top of of other basic inventions. 
So, but that is, the, you know, it's also, you know, as a historian of scientists, as a historian of science, you know, the history of the world, the history of technology is such that, yeah. you know, all human progress has been this interesting, um, this interesting dance between technological invention and social adoption, right? Um, you know, yeah. and how did, you know, how did the clipper ship get invented, you know, in terms of and how and why or whatever, if you want to consider that a, um, a, a fundamental, you know, invention, how did the clock, you know, how did the clock get, you know, invented as a way of, of navigation? Um, so, et cetera, et cetera. So, it, 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 you know, it's, it, so there is an argument that says, there's an argument that says that invention is pulled out of basic research by the needs of of society um you know yeah. we you know we make we make progress in fundamental invention um because of a you know partly because of a pull partly because that is what prompts the scientists to say how come we don't understand this you know because there's a lot of things we don't understand but what yeah. causes a researcher to say this is more important to understand than this, you know? And so now some things are hard to understand and it takes longer to invent around or to invent around them. Like for example, the brain. I mean, people have been trying to figure out the brain mm, for a long time. <laughs> and for whatever reason, you know, we don't yet quite have the technology to study the brain the way we wish we could study the brain. So, um, yeah. so it, you know, those things are evolving, but they take much longer than we wish they would. You know, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I grew up, I grew up in Chicago or outside of Chicago. And um, this scientist from Argonne National Laboratories, which was based outside of Chicago, came to my high school physics class and said, you know, and said, by the mid 80s, by the mid '80s, we will have fusion power, and remember that. Fusion... <laughs> hmm. They only you know, have it and... in Italy now. You know, <laughs> a joke. Yeah. It's so Italians have got it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's fusilli. That's not fission. <laughs> sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but, uh, my, but, bad. Sorry. my bad. <laughs> bad. Always get that wrong. Uh, so the um, the the but yeah the. Um, uh, yeah, so there is, you know, there have been a lot of it. There have been a lot. Your, you know, your point. There have been a lot of promises in in fundamental invention that that just haven't, you know, been fulfilled. Um, but there's there has been, you know, so the question of whether or not innovation has in any way been held back by the lack of underlying in you know basic research. Adopted innovation. I feel like adopted innovation. That well, it's. I don't. I don't know yeah. what the correct terminology is. But yeah. certainly, I wouldn't. Technology. Technological process goes. Progress goes. Irrespective of the Second World War didn't end it. Um, the 1918 yeah. epidemic didn't end it. It just. Uh, it seems to be inbuilt. It seems to be built in the universal universal model right. of the universe. Um, right. What I want to get is is one thing. We definitely have less public funding for universities. Um, at least on a percentage GDP basis, not nominally, yeah. you know, these values right. have all um, exploded. Yeah. And so that seems to be a worry. And a lot of people say Silicon Valley, people go there to steal technology, raise so much money that nobody can compete with them and just scale it. And mm -hmm. I think that might be the cynical view on it. But I think this is a lot of there's a lot of truth to it, right? And you, you just mentioned that too. And I think mm -hmm. the what people underestimate is that it's not the technology that changes the world, it's the adoption in people's hands. So how it makes the individual more productive. Because in the end we don't have a living um, computer being, right? We we, we need right. humans to be more productive. This is the only right. way we, we grow out of this into the stars, right? We need right. to be more productive. Oh maybe the maybe the machines right. are gonna be more 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 um intelligent. Maybe that's a question I should ask you. Yeah. You know, it, it, do you oh. think AGI will happen. Do you think it's 100 years away, 500 years away? Um, yeah. Do you do you think it's a threat or it's it's a huge opportunity? And oh, because I feel this yeah. is just the, the the last part of that question. What I always yeah. feel 
if we have real AGI, even if it's 100 times faster than VRA, yeah. it will have similar values to us, more or less, because we created these values over time and they helped yeah. us. And B, they will probably ignore us, but uh, I think they're not a huge threat to us because they will mostly ignore us. <laughs> well, you know, so, I mean, the, so there's a, uh, yeah, so the, uh, there's this, there is this desire to speak of, you know, general intelligence or artificial general intelligence as being sort of some point, you know, there will be a date at which we have crossed over some threshold that will be some magical threshold, you know, because partly because Ray Kurzweil has this sort of singularity thing that he puts a date on. Um, and, and so th the reality is that, you know, we have had machine intelligence far surpass human intelligence in many, many dimensions, in many, many places for many, many, many years, right? And yeah. so all we're seeing, all we're seeing is this, this sort of continuous increment um, where machines are able to do things that, you know, it used to be that they weren't very good at doing. So things like speaking and things like translating and things like writing, you know, they're getting better and better and better at. But obviously, they've been way better at math than we have for a long, long time. Um, and the issue there was not our machines better, than, better at math than humans. The issue was, can we integrate machines into human processes in such a way as to make humans more productive? Yes. Right? I mean, and, and, and so... You know where you know so that will continue over over lots and lots of segments. One of the areas that I spent a big chunk of time in is in education, right? So in what way, obviously, machines can be infinitely more personal and more patient in providing education than a human can, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, than a human tutor. So conceptually, conceptually we should be able to tutor at a personal individual level every child and every adult uh, around yeah. every topic and any topic to their level <clears throat> to the appropriate level of of complexity and engagement so that's personalized for every individual i mean conceptually that seems like a no brainer yeah and i thought you know and so this was my fourth company right so this is my fourth company <laughs> um <clears throat> And it was uh, it was an ed tech company. And you're always ahead of time, Bill. Uh, <laughs> I can see a pattern there. You're, yeah. way, you're way ahead, man. Wow. And um, and so my my partner and I we developed this concept called computer mediated instruction. And you know our whole thesis was that computers were not there yet, and they wouldn't be there for the long for a long period of time. But computers can make teachers or professors or whatever, tutors, computers can make teachers much more productive when used appropriately. And so that was this model we called computer media and instruction. It actually, you know, it worked out very well. We actually wound up taking the company public. So that one actually did succeed. Okay. But, but it turns out getting, you know, developing curriculum for computer mediated instruction is incredibly expensive. Um, you know, and... And you've got this problem of it getting out of date quickly, so that there's still issues. There's still issues. There are a lot of issues there still, but but you know. So the but the 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 un, you know your point. <laughs> back to your point about um, you know. Yeah, what time will we have AI? What, what do you think? Or you know, in terms of of how fast how fast technology will you know turn into what we call AGI. I don't think there will ever, ever be a point at which oh, okay. I don't think there will ever be a point at which we confuse computers with humans. Well, it's going to be different. I, I, that's for sure. But I was really, I was really curious. One of the the, the makers of GPT three um, was on yeah. a podcast, and he was he was stating he, there's a good percentage, he didn't say 100%, but he said there's yeah. a good percentage that GPT-5, which is going to happen in two or three years, yeah. is going to feel like artificial into artificial general intelligence. Yeah, now, I mean, gonna, I have no feel, doubt. Right, in the sense of, it's not just a Turing test, it's, it's 
it can develop its own concepts. It has a sense of being, um, or it seems to us that it has that. We, we, it's it's going to be tricky for the first couple of years to figure this out. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's yeah. going to be the eye of the, the beholder. So there's a lot of you know things that we we we, we can um, discount this a little. But the idea that there's someone not there's I'm not saying it's going to be a literature or lit poetry unnecessarily, or maybe that's what it is because GPT three is good at poetry. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a per there's going to be something where we feel we are kind of confused. Was this done by a really well skilled person? Absolutely. Or not? Right. And we're like, yeah, well, yeah. I really don't know. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's the, you know, sort of classic Turing test approach to this concept. And yeah. absolutely, there's no doubt that we will have, because, you know, I'll tell you, I don't care about GP, GPT-5, GPT-3, I, you know, I mean, I, every day, I have to deal with people whose writing, you know, is, is unbelievably bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and, English is, is so, not an easy language. I, mean, I, I know how this works. So I have very little doubt. I have very little doubt that computers can do a much better job at writing than yeah. um, than most humans can do, right? I mean, yeah. um, you know, in the same, you know, in in a similar way to computers can do a better job playing chess. Computers can do a better job of doing math. Computers can do a better job of of tracking things, right? So much I mean, left for so, us. Not pardon? Much left. There's What's not much left? left for us. Either. No, 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 no. I mean, there is. No. There's a huge. There's you know. There is. There is a, a a huge part of our lives that is all about you know interacting with other human beings in ways that you know get things done. Now, you know, the eventually, you know, okay. So I am, I am very much on the other side of the argument of the, um, I don't know where, I don't know who, who gets, you know, the, the idea that computers will replace humans and that, and that we have to worry about employment anytime in the near future, um, yes. I think is a you know i i think is a mistaken idea because the dynamics of the job world are such that you know the so um the example that is sometimes given is we're going to make we're going to develop autonomous trucks right so we're yeah. going to develop autonomous trucks so all of the prognosticators say oh my god you know, there are 10 million people in the United States who drive trucks. And, you know, what's going to happen if we put 10 million truck drivers out of work? And that's just, you know, that's not the way, that's not the way human society works. And if you look at, if you look at the truck driving population of the United States, the reality is it's almost impossible to keep people as truck drivers because, for the most part, very few people like being truck drivers. They're only truck drivers because they can't find any other job to do. And well, that's they would harsh. Try... That's harsh. No, that's it's harsh. not harsh. It's you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't mean <laughs> they're not harsh. capable. It doesn't mean they're not capable of performing other jobs. It just yeah. means that the, whatever in whatever their circumstance is, that's the best job they can get right now. So okay. Okay. you know, that's fine. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, that's fine. But and so if you look at the 10 million, you know, the average duration of a truck driver's job is less than a year because they quit so yeah. quick. They quit so fast. So truck. So yeah. it happens. It happens that I'm an investor in a logistics company. And, yeah. you know, so. But, so the, but Bill, I'm, I'm with you. I think, I think most yeah. people um, are, are with you. You know, obviously, the, the, the way of technological change replaces uh, certain jobs and it always pushes up to being more productive and i think this has happened for billions of years or millions of years it's not <laughs> right. that. we're not quite the, that old the, yeah. the trouble obviously is is that uh, the the people who do better in the future might not be the same people in the past but again there's nothing we can do about that i mean yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we can we can fight it for a few years like the, the coal miners in europe i think they got like um 30 years of, of um sunset time for no reason, right? The coal was yeah. already much cheaper from China for a long time. 
So we can do this as a social policy, and I think this is this is uh, it's 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 crazy to do this on a large scale. I think everyone agrees. The other problem to it is that not just it's different people; it's also um, it, the percentages can be off. So we can say, okay, thirty percent of the U.S. population is going to lose their job in the next ten years, but only we have only twenty percent more jobs. It's like for a long time these 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 changes and obviously it, all the changes will create better and more jobs and more productive jobs but it can be a, there can be a big delay in between and it can be 30 40 years and this can be really turbulent times i think this is what people are worried about that this new industrial revolution is going to be great but in between it can be pretty nasty and, but if uh, you'll notice if you'll notice yeah. you know every every cycle has shown that the you know the penetration of new technologies has always created a shortage of jobs not i mean a sh yeah a shortage yes, a shortage of talent not yes. a shortage of jobs a surplus of jobs and a shortage of talent yes so totally in, in every in every you know economic cycle so the issue is not are there enough you know there, the issue is not are there enough jobs there are i have zero doubt there will be plenty of jobs. The issue is, of course, are the are people trained to fill those jobs? Are they, yes. you know, it might are be they only in... their children, right? For the, for the for people over fifty, it might not be, or it might be the opposite. Maybe the more over fifty are better off than the under twenty. Well, it depends on the job, right? It depends on yeah. the task, exactly. right? I mean, yeah. and so, so the, you know, there will be. I have no doubt, you know, uh, job opportunities that are enabled for people who currently, because they are infirm, they can't go out and stock the shelves of Walmart, right? And not that that's whatever, but, 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 but because of technology, they can, they can book travel or whatever, right? Or they can do problem solving. Um, yeah, it's, all it's, it's, I'm fully with you and we, we haven't right? even done, you know, most the technology penetration in like huge places like Africa is minimal. And, um, if, if this changes and Africa has its own problems, but there's there's an amazing amount of minds that we can enable to really, you know, nine billion people who do one singular job in their lifetime. That's kind of the, what I'm telling my kids do yeah. one singular thing. And it might not be the first thing you have to do a couple of those. But yeah. in the end, it's going to be one thing you're going to be remembered for. And then all the nine billion people will be more productive from this. And yeah. This I think it's going to happen. I'm fully with you, but the trouble is the, the social in between. I'm not. Sometimes I'm not sure that the U.S. is going to well, going to get the best out of this. Like the, <laughs> at least the last twenty years, I've felt like the U.S. hasn't gotten the best deal out of this. They didn't exactly suffer, um, but um, in relation to other economies, they they've been kind of left behind, so to speak. Well, and, and you know, people talk about this as some upcoming problem that's you know going to happen as you know machine intelligence becomes better as if yeah. you know uh oh this is coming well guess what it's here it's yeah, here it's, that's true yeah. <laughs> right? it's nothing we you can know. do about it anyways well but. yeah but it's not it's you know the future is here and it's been here for 20 years it's just not evenly distributed right to reframe the famous gibson comet right yeah. so people have been displaced by technology for you know the last 50 years people have been displaced by technology it's Probably, just yeah, right i mean uh, you know so so, so i have one i have yeah. one more question and then, then yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. we can we can leave ai for you but that's okay that's say you have a startup that comes to you right and it has yeah. general artificial intelligence and okay. you feel like this thing you didn't expect it but it happened anyway so just assume this for a second okay and all right they have and they want to build it bigger so they have like a little version and they want to let it out of the box but you know this could be like the manhattan moment right you, you don't know if this is safe it sounds safe but it couldn't you couldn't validate it but you uh -huh. want to keep it small because the company if they succeed with this kind of like china right um, if you succeed with a quantum computer or with a general ai even if this will never happen well, let's assume it for a second yeah yeah if yeah, you, yeah. Do, yeah. You, you you kind of rule the planet what would you do in this situation? What would you say? Okay, let's let's really make this big. Let's let's be extremely careful. But then maybe someone else is gonna gonna take over and develop this safely. Well, how would you handle this? Well, I mean, it's such a um, unlikely thought experiment, but <laughs> it is. It <laughs> is science you know, fiction. It's but, pure science yeah. fiction, right? But I, I but I, I, you know, I sort of like I sort of like your Manhattan Project um, framing. Um, 
you know, as a historian, historian of science who looked into nuclear proliferation, right? So I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, sort of very much a J. Robert Oppenheimer fan in the sense that, you know, what he thought was appropriate, um, what he thought was appropriate at the end of the war was to turn nuclear power into a into an internationally managed technology. Um, yeah. And so he was advocating for the IE, IAEC, you know, from way, way back. Of course, the generals didn't like that idea. Um, and so there was this, there was this, um, this conflict within the U.S. around the management of, of nuclear technology. And so, you know, in that thought experiment, if I thought suddenly I had stumbled on I had stumbled on a technology that was going to change the world and at a level that potentially could be misused. You know, I would, first of all, I would encourage the entrepreneur to take appropriate steps for surrounding this technology and this, and this company with, with layers of relationships that would enable us to both take advantage of the benefits of this technology, but at some level control the negative possible outcomes of this technology, you know, to the point of potentially engaging government assets or government, you know, government level people in, in thinking about, okay, you know, what's the right way? What's the right way to benefit the most people um, with the, uh, with the advent of this new technology? So, uh, I, you know, I would be, you know, that would be unbelievably exciting to be, yeah. you know, to be part of that. And I can't imagine any of my peers who would take a different approach to, you know, screw the regulators, screw the governments, you know, full speed ahead. Let's just let's just maximize our return on this particular opportunity. Um, and who cares if it turns out to end, end humanity as we know it, <laughs> you know, yeah, I, you right. know, I mean, if that's your, you know, if that's the framing of the thought experiment, that's, yeah, um, I would, you know, I mean, I almost certainly you could write that, you could write that movie um, in terms of, yeah, that's a good I mean, one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, you know, you know I compared this and, and you lived on the other side, but uh -huh. I noticed from Jordan Peterson, he got um, very concerned, even depressed um, in his own mind about nuclear proliferation and especially this in, 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 impending beating World War um, to, to between the U.S. and the USSR. Uh -huh. And he's seen this from the U.S. side, right, or from the Canadian side. And he's like, man, this is going to happen tomorrow. And for whatever reason, he felt it emotionally much stronger than most people, I guess. Huh. And But on, on the other side, people had the same, like in the U.S. as well, they had the exact same but better view, right? They were constantly under threat from the U.S. And they constantly right. felt um, this could happen tomorrow and we have to do our right. best. And literally sent a nuclear bomb first because we're going to be gone tomorrow because yeah. you know, the bomb is already underway. So... These things had been around for a long time, but for for and it's almost like a miracle, it, nothing ever happened. Like the, the the accident that was bound to happen never happened, and I, I'm, I'm amazed um, that humanity could handle this. I would have expected much more, way more accidents. I mean, these things can go off just you know just because they went off, and there were very few accidents. Now with COVID, we kind of see the other side, right, where we feel like something right. that never happened in a long time it suddenly yeah. happened. And, if right. it's from a lab or not, whatever it is, right. it is it is it kind of one of those things that was supposed to happen all the time, but they somehow never happened. Right? Do you do you think there's more coming? So we, we see they call it volatility in public markets, or do you feel we're going to enter a somewhat more peaceful period in the next twenty years? Nah. <laughs> there's a gap yeah. feeling. Nobody knows. Yeah. Right? yeah, 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 yeah. So. So I am, you know, I am, I am a, I am fun, you know, I'm fundamentally an optimist. I mean, I wouldn't yeah. have done what I've done over the last 10 years if I weren't fundamentally an optimist, right? Of course. Um, and uh, um, uh, so in terms of, you know, my faith in humanity, however, <laughs> um, I have to admit that um, it was actually the meltdown it was actually the 2008 financial crisis that that okay. that did make a very significant dent 
in my in my core optimism um because okay. the bubble the bubble was just irrational exuberance um yeah. the meltdown was a system you know systemic failure i mean it was a it was a failure i mean the bubble was yeah. a mistake but the meltdown was a failure um yeah. and then this covid thing also is a failure and yeah. you know it's the the fact of the um, virus is is certainly understandable. That's you know the fact of the virus is is not a failure, but the way we dealt with it is clearly a failure. And I agree. and and so you know interesting what we will learn what we will learn from it. So I am now, in spite of my fundamental optimism, um, I am now much more realistic about. Um, about the ability of of societies to fail, yeah. and and so it is. I don't know if you've read any Jared Diamond. Um, no, but, um, is he the CEO of? of no, no, no. That's no. that's um, that's um, that's uh, that's Jamie Diamond. Jamie oh, Diamond yeah. is the CEO of J.P. Morgan. Jared yeah. Diamond is a UCLA professor okay. um, who wrote a book. He got, he be, he became famous for a book called Guns, Germs, and Steel. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a it's a sort of biological explanation of the success and failure of different civilizations on the planet. Okay. Um, and, you know, basically he explains the success of the European civilization because of because of the proximity of 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 um, of uh, of animals of um uh you know uh of livestock or whatever of um uh but of animals that were uh that were made to become human uh, livestock for humans but he explains the european civilization biologically um and in, in a sort of in a very interesting way um, yeah. but um so it's worth it's it's worth a read but then he also talks about the collapse of other civilizations and the failure of other civilizations so, but we, you know, we think, okay, that's all history. That doesn't apply anymore. That, you know, now, thanks to technology and communications and global governance, we have the ability to catch and, and mitigate, you know, sort of serious uh, societal failures um, faster than we could in previous centuries, right? Yeah. So, you know, but then the meltdown happens and, yeah, you know, we didn't, you know, we fixed, we sort of fixed it in whatever. But now this COVID thing happens and we haven't figured quite, you know, we're sort of fixing it. Um, so I have to answer your question. You know, I have no doubts that we will continue to have these hiccups in the future. I think they will be in the grand scheme of human progress. I think they will be hiccups on the pathway to continuous progress, but um, I, um, I am more realistic, I think, now than I was, for example, in the 90s. Um, yes. I was, I was, I thought, boy, you know, the world is such a better place now we're in the 90s. We Man. were all a little bipolar. The main thing <laughs> of a bipolar person, I feel. If you're looking back, right, I didn't realize it, of course, myself at the time. But when I look back, and now we are on the other side, I feel we came out on this strong negativity that's basically everywhere. Um, I, I feel personally that we we going to go through one bigger event, and they call it like a sucker punch, you know, like a huge volatility event, just like COVID. I feel there's going to be either this separation in the U.S. or something that has to do with China, something not so positive. And um, once this is done and we, we, we kind of regroup, I think there is a huge positive um, future out there, probably not in the next 10 years and maybe not in the next 15, huh. but once huh. it starts from there. And I, I'm, I'm a true believer in Rick as well as many in, in, in Silicon Valley. I feel like he's really onto something. Um, Obviously, it might huh. not be 2045. It might be 2060, right? I mean, who knows? Um, I'm not taking it so seriously, but I think yeah. there's a grand overarching scheme. There's something to it. The, the trouble always is that I see is that technology is, is, is going to run forward, but we still have those. When you look into the old Greek literature, we read Plato and Socrates, we have the exact same issues. We haven't moved forward an inch, I feel. 
We maybe <laughs> think we do because we have some laws and we have, yes, but the way they really ponder in, in society and how people interact with these, I mean, nobody knows what the laws of the US are. I mean, even lawyers have no clue. And so <laughs> so these, these values are very different than laws. And people think, oh, we are, we are like the Roman Empire. Everything's codified, it's good, and it's been working. I don't think it's going to protect us. So the moral issue will come first, and then hope we're going to regroup this and maybe take advantage of technology again. Where do you think the where do you think the potential significant flaws are in our you know cracks in the system that are going to cause a sucker punch event? Well, I feel I don't I don't put my, I can't put my finger to it, but I feel COVID is just a catalyst. The 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 actual impact. If, and I agree with you, if you handle it properly, and some states in the U.S. do, but generally it hasn't been properly handled. There's been a crazy, um, I call it a mind virus that has been going on the last few years and, and in people's oh. heads, and it's made them crazy. On the, this is all sides of the political um, spectrum, and everywhere you go in the, US, in the world, it's yeah. right in the U.S., but you even feel in Africa, you can go to like South Africa, or you can go to, yeah. to Nairobi, you feel have the same impact. So this mind virus is something that I feel is, is a moral scaffolding that we have lost and the intense it, it was intentional right it's not an accident and we, we need to rebuild this moral scaffolding but it's it, it it needs a negative catalyst i feel and this negative catalyst can be any of those things it can be a war with china it can be the decession uh, for most states like california from the u.s i think it's something big that hasn't happened in a long time and mm. that will will impede um, the, 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 say the private sector, but it will create this, this huge basic research into probably weapons. You know, it could be something more, more nicely, um, more nice. But once mm. this is done, we will see a repeat of the Second World War, this 90 year cycle. You're probably a historian, you're very familiar with this. The 90 year cycle is, is extremely <sighs> powerful because that's two no. generations, three generations, right? Interesting. I'm, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, and maybe I'm just in den denial. Um, but I do think one of the things that has happened um, that that I, you know was was kind of always it was always true, but um, technology has made it more important than it used to be, which is the which is the 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 um, degree to which the global community is interconnected um, at the personal level. Um, yeah. And at the personal level, including commercial level, and the degree to which there are people, you know, there are uh, tens of thousands, probably hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people in China who have worked for U.S. corporations, um, yeah. you know, and there are, um, you know, fewer people in America who have worked um, with and for the Chinese, but as far nevertheless, as we know, as far as we know Bill, <laughs> I wouldn't be so sure about that. I think it's widespread. It's widespread right? Well, no, but what I mean, what I mean is, what I mean is that openly, you know, openly. hopefully, you know, separate from sort of the geopolitical shenanigans that you know yeah. that every you know that everybody engages in over, you know, over cycles of politics, of geopolitics. Separate from that, there is this underlying glue of relationships at the commercial level and to some extent at the personal level that I think will, to some extent, mitigate the likelihood of these things happening. Now, I, I say I, that... I agree. <laughs> but, you know, the last five years, people have been destroying all these relationships. They I have know. remapping their model of the world and yeah. relationships with people who are slightly different than me, it yeah. just doesn't happen. And it goes for yeah. all sides of the spectrum. So you go to Germany, yeah. they hate the French now, and they always hated the French, but they now they hate them more. Yeah. And you go, Democrats hate the Republicans and vice versa, and Chinese hate yeah. the, I don't know, the Koreans, and the Koreans hate the Russians. It's all over the place. It's yeah. it's just a pullback, right? It's a rubber band. Yeah. You really had no. huge globalization, 1930, right. and then it just snapped, and it's going to come back. I mean, that's that's not what yeah. I'm worried about. But the in-between is might going to be a little messy. Yeah. No, I, you know, I, I, I hear you. And I know, again, going back, you know, going back in history, there was, you know, uh, the Germans, the French and the British were, you know, reasonably well integrated, you know, in the 19th century, I mean, yeah. even though they fought, you know, even though there was some, <laughs> we, we had a few bumps in the road. <laughs> 
you but can say that. Nevertheless, yeah. Well, I mean, the Brits always won, right? So that's <laughs> no, but nobody had a chance. So they just okay. Let's let's give them the win. And, <laughs> but 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 I tell you what, and this a lot of people don't know that there's this. Some countries have huge superiority complexes. Germany still has it. They they think if you, I oh, mean, deep down, yeah. right? If you yeah. just go out there and ask yeah. people, they will they will not admit it. Yeah. But deep down, they think the world has done them unjust, especially with after the Second World War. They they yeah. should have not been punished, and they have this this sense of revenge. Um, and not everybody has it, but it's 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 palpable in society. And it's, yeah. if you go to China, it's very palpable. If you go to Russia, yeah. very palpable. If you yeah. go to Iran, yeah. Yeah. Um, these, yeah. these yeah. things happen. And I agree. Maybe, I know. maybe it's going to go away, but it could happen. But no. usually, it breaks out in a fight, like Japan had it with the U.S. Right? And then it's over. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, it is naive. It is naive to think that somehow humans have changed so much that they can't get into fights anymore, right? Yeah, I just, <laughs> it's, it's, and it's, the more you avoid this with Nassim Taleb, he, he writes about that a lot. The more you avoid these volatility and confrontations, as make, or the worse you make the actual confrontation once it happens. So people should let it out. So I'm not worried about yeah. what's going on in the US yeah. right now, but yeah. something that can happen. Yeah. No, and I, you know, and I, you know, I, I, I sort of came up on the academic side very much an internationalist, um, yeah. and and it feels as though um, it feels as though most, you know, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, which gives, you know, which has sort of the most sort of traditionally liberal globalist framework of any U.S. institution. Um, and even within the council, you're seeing, you're seeing more and more people who are, you know, becoming more sort of realists about, about the decay of, the, of, global institu- of international institutions, of, of global governance and global cooperation, you know, global trade is declining. There's all sorts of negative indicators. Um, they're everywhere. You know, they're everywhere. Yeah, you look at the yeah. Fed, you look at the global the, yeah. the GDP, the GDP ratio. Every single metric you look at, not every single one, but a lot of these big big metrics, they all look bad. And they look really bad. Yeah. And they haven't looked that bad in a long time. Now, yeah. but on okay. the other hand, you, you're the optimist. You can always say, yes, we're going to have this huge growth and GDP is going to rise by 5% every year for the next 20 years. And it's a GDP. We don't even have to worry about that anymore because it, it will, will be eradicated in like 10 years, 20 years. Could be. I'm sorry. Germany almost pulled it off. Eradicated what? No, well, well if, we, if the GDP to, to debt ratio will be much nicer if we grow GDP so much. Oh, 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 right. Yes. The right. No, I mean, you're right. Can. No, I bet you, and we didn't even touch on it, but... But this whole unbelievable debt creation cycle we've gone through, that's, you know, that has got to have an impact. It has to have an impact on government policy, fiscal policy, ec- the economics of the world. And there is, so it really means there's almost zero chance of having robust economic growth over the next 10 years. I mean, so I think there's, it's pretty close to zero. There'll be a little bit of a bounce back. I mean, we'll have a we'll have some, we'll funky, have some numbers, funky numbers um, in terms of bounce back, but now I'm getting some feedback here. Feedback here. here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh man. Oops. Only, now I'm, I'm basically done. Also. Um, okay. A, All right. I just wanted to. Audible. I, I, I want to you, end. I want you to finish. Yes. I wanted to end on an optimistic note, Dorsen. <laughs> <laughs> so again, that. you know, I love that. Uh, no, no. I mean, again, fundamentally, um, you know, n- there is just, in spite of COVID, what and this is this is what's amazing to me. In spite of COVID, the venture ecosystem has been stunningly robust this year, and you know, and I'm I'm dialing in every day. You know, this morning I dialed into Israel. Um, last week, I was dialing in. You no, know, yesterday, I was dialing into Japan. Last week, I was dialing into Vietnam. I mean, so it's unbelievable to me how robust the global innovation ecosystem is in terms of entrepreneurs and venture capital and accelerators and innovation. How astonishingly robust it is in spite of COVID. So now at some point it's got to have, you know, 
in terms of budgets and money and, and macroeconomics, they've got to have an effect on a lot of companies. And obviously, they're having effect on several companies. But fundamentally, it's, it's in, it, this, this level of innovation and the support for entrepreneurs has never been greater. And the fact that it hasn't been significantly dampened by COVID is an incredibly positive signal. So in spite of all the negative signals we see out there, there are extraordinary positive signals around innovation, entrepreneurship, venture capital, and, and you know, sort of new technologies making the world a better place. So with that... <laughs> I just wanted to, to say, I think you, you almost got me convinced, Bill. That, that was extremely... <laughs> no, it was an extremely great um, way to... to, to uh, So I couldn't hear your last sentence, but I'm assuming it was a compliment of some sort. <laughs> um, I apologize. Um, I just wanted to say it, it was yeah. fantastic that you took the time and I learned a lot. And I think it was a great opportunity to reflect on those issues. And you almost got me convinced. I feel I'm like 99% there. That <laughs> okay. Okay. And the ecosystem is in much better shape than I probably thought. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is. So don't worry about innovators. Okay. Worry about governments, worry about politicians, um, worry about coal miners, but don't worry about innovators. Okay. <laughs>